the most interesting guests in the music industry, entertainment, art, and politics, step into the studio for Turning Point with Frank McKay. This week on Turning Point with Frank McKay, Frank talks with music producer Steve Thompson about his career in music production and the changes that have occurred in the business throughout the decades. Let's listen to this intriguing interview. And now, Turning Point with Frank McKay. Welcome to Turning Point. Our very special guest today is producer extraordinaire, Steve Thompson. Steve, welcome. Hi, Frank. Thanks for inviting me. It's been a long time. Yes, it has. Listen, I, I don't know if people listening know the resume, but it's just amazing. I just want to rattle off a couple of names. Madonna, and these are in no particular order, but these are bands or artists that you've worked with, and correct me if I'm wrong, Madonna, Whitney Houston, Guns N' Roses, Tesla, uh, Metallica, John Lennon. I, I know I'm missing a whole bunch, but I, that, that's a hell of a resume, and it's pretty diverse at that. Uh, what is it like to work with this kind of diversity? Well, it's kind of interesting because, you know, when I first got into production and working on music, my goal was to be a chameleon, to be able to adapt to all styles of music. And most people try that, but they fail. But, you know, I was a club DJ in New York for 10, 16 years, worked on radio like BLS, Kiss, and KTU, did shows for them. So when you do that, you, you tend to have a wide range of styles that you, that you live with. So, you know, I got to the point where I said, you know, I, I don't want to do the same record twice, and that's what spurred me to work with a lot of different artists. Like you mentioned, the artists I work with, I also work with Korn, Wu-Tang, Public Enemy, uh, Canadian Tenors. I mean, you know, the only thing I haven't done is Polka, and I don't think I'll ever get there. But, you know, <laughs> it, 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 it keeps you fresh, you know, because I think in this business, your life expectancy is probably worse than a football player. Yeah, no and question. so I find myself redeveloping my style every time I go out. You know, I'm not complacent, and I feel you have to retain that hunger. And I think you have to keep your your mentality around 14 to 16 years old, and that's proven very successful with me. We're speaking with producer Steve Thompson. Steve, you mentioned spinning in the New York clubs. Uh, what was that? Were you in dance interior? What, what well, it's kind of interesting. Yeah, I've been to a lot of clubs. I've done guest spots at Studio 54, the Paradise Garage. I worked at Channel 80 in Long Island, Speaks. Uh, worked in a lot of different clubs. And, um, you know, obviously DJs today like Skrillex and all these new school DJs who are commanding, you know, the Swedish House Mafia sold out Madison Square Garden. They're commanding a million per show, which I guess I missed the boat on that one. Mm. It was a lot different then because you work with turntables and vinyl. Today, it's they have things out there, software like Tractor, where you could take two records and just press a button and it does all your mixing for you, which to me is kind of boring. Yeah, <laughs> I've what? always liked the idea of working for turntables. What is it? But yeah. uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah, I was going to say, what does it do to your style, or what does it do as an education as a producer? actually playing records live and getting the feedback from that live crowd? Oh, I'll give you, for instance, you know, it's it's a great to see how people respond to, because I remember I was still DJing in clubs when I worked with, you know, like Whitney Houston, I want to dance with somebody, Madonna, Open Your Heart, and Guns N' Roses. And I remember, you know, I was working in clubs that had 3,000 people in it. And Whitney Houston, I Want to Dance with Somebody, became the number one song of the year. But I remember the first time I played it, it cleared the dance floor. And I got scared because I just got out of the studio and I was testing it out on them. Wow. But later on, it became a number one dance song. You, what's good about working in clubs is that as a DJ, you look into the future. You don't try to chase trends. You try to start trends. And that applies to music where, you know, if Taylor Swift's hot today or Adele or Muse... You know, you know, people try to chase that style, and by the time it actually comes out, that style's done with. So you have to look in the future, and I think DJing has made me realize that. You were a, you were an essential part of the Appetite for Destruction, Guns N' Roses' debut, and really breakout 
album that really changed a lot of things. That album took a while before it broke, if I remember. It was probably about six, seven months before it really took off the way it did. Uh, do you remember, while you were recording that, what your expectations of the album was? No, it's interesting you said that. Um, at the time, I was working on a lot of um, pop artists like Madonna, Whitney Houston, Aretha Franklin, and everything was going number one. I know this sounds stupid, but I was getting bored. And I had a friend at Geffen Records. I called up Tom Zutat, who was an A&R for Geffen Records at the time. I said, Tom, you have to give me some rock bands to do. I'm going nuts here. So the first two bands he gave me were Tesla and Guns N' Roses. Mm, wow. To make uh, a long story short, uh, we were doing Tesla, and we were working on three other albums at the same time, and Tom gave me the demos to Appetite for Destruction. Loved the band. Absolutely loved it. I think the first song that really spurred me was Welcome to the Jungle when I heard the demo. And I said, I want to work with this band. Unfortunately, um, we were burnt. They wanted to start right away, and we just needed to get a little rest before we get going. So I said, tell you what, Tom, get somebody to produce it, and we'll mix it for you. <clears throat> so as far as what I really appreciated about Geffen Records, they spent over a year breaking that record which says a lot for how great their their team was. I mean, I had to sit down with David Geffen and love the man. I love this concept and everything. And just a quick thing, I remember him, uh, you know, show me all the people that works for him. He, said, he points to this guy and he goes, see this guy here? He says he hasn't done anything. He's been cold for about two years. But you know what? I really feel that this guy's going to come up with something great. And sure enough, six months later, he signs Nirvana. Oh, man. Getting back to Guns N' Roses, and, and I really love the whole concept of the band. I felt that's where rock and roll needed to be in that time and place, because they had a sense of danger. It wasn't conforming to all the so-called hair metal bands that were out there. It had an angst to it. And I really felt strong about that. And I remember when we were working on the record, Sweet Child of Mine, which I said, you know, it's a great song, but let's just keep this, the album rock. And thank God they said... No, Steve, we're going to put this on the record. So the first single they released was Welcome to the Jungle. They wound up re-releasing that song probably three times. And then obviously they, they went with Sweet Child of Mine, and that's when MTV hit it, and that's when it blew up. And I have to give Geffen credit because, you know, record companies today will not do that. You know, at that time, you know, record companies were nurturing artists. They were developing them. They were breaking them, and they took the time to be able to do that. In today's climate, that doesn't happen. Who was calling the shots on the, the marketing of that record? Was it Zutat? Was he, did he have a, a lot of clout? Well, at Zutat that was A&R. They have a whole marketing department. Well, they no, have I a know whole that. promotion department. Yeah, but I know. Zutat was very influential on that record. Yeah. Very. He believed in it, right? Even when it was dragging along a little? Oh, yeah. I mean, you know what I loved about Tom? I mean, he would just camp out with the band. He would help develop their demos. He was around every step of the way. And that's what I loved about what an A&R person should be doing. Now, A&R sits on YouTube and see who has the most hits before they'll look at them. Well, it's, interesting. it's a shame. It's interesting you bring that up. You know, when you t talk to different people that have kind of spanned the years here uh, between the music business, You've seen, in, in a really relatively short period of time, the music business completely change. And it really, it's the Internet. And if you, uh, if you see what's going on, uh, I was going to ask you how you like it, but I guess you answered that. It's, it's a much different animal now, am I right? It's a totally different animal. You know, to me, I compare the music industry to basically businesses around the world. And here's the problem I have the way people do business nowadays is a lot of times they get rid of the creative people in their business. I don't care what business it is. They, they cut corners. They hire accounts and lawyers to run out the creative department, which they have no clue how to do. They get rid of the creative people. And to me, to have a great product, you have to have the, the right creative people to be able to make that product. And I've seen this happen in businesses around the world, and it's such an easy solution. But egos get in the way. Paychecks get in the way. And it's a shame that you look at the movies today. Name me uh, the, the one movie that you could say is timeless, classic, and epic in the last five or ten years. What would that movie be in your mind? I, I can't. And please don't say Avatar. 
No, not Avatar, but I, I don't know. I don't even know what would uh, what comes to mind. What, what are you uh, What are you thinking? Uh, I I can't because it's a shame. I just wrote a script, yeah. by the way, a movie, and you know that's the problem. Is everybody's taking cheap shortcuts and said, "Hey, you know, it's like Guns and Roses." Okay, they spent probably about a year breaking this record, and the bottom line is it sold probably close to forty million worldwide, which is billions of dollars of revenue. Mm. Now record companies will give you like that five or ten minutes, if that, and they're happy to, you know, sell fifty thousand copies and move on to the next thing. I mean, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. It's like with anything, you have to work it. And I understand the financial ramifications of A and R, and I understand the new school business today. I can relate to that because of the internet. Hey, g- give me a little bit uh, about your script. Uh, that's interesting. Is that your first script that you've written? Yes, I wrote it with actually my fellow New Yorker, Ken Kushner, is an independent film uh, director and producer. Love him. And he was actually in a band I worked with in the early 90s. And it's a movie called Souls. It is going to be one of those big, epic movies. That's all I can say because, you know, I find myself to be a movie fictionado. And I know what it takes to make a great movie. And uh, just like with music, you know, I see, you know, when I leave, I want to leave a legacy. I want, you know, like, hey, that guy worked on the greatest stuff in the world. I mean, that's what drives me. I, I mean, I'm I don't like to be second best. <laughs> I like to be the bandwagon, not follow it. Well, you uh, to give you a quick story. It's basically about the history of the world and it shows the evolution of the world and shows the evolution of God's children and the devil's disciples and it's very intense if you took, like, uh, the intensity of the Star Wars and everything like that, and you took the intensity of knowing uh, movies like that and put it together. It, it, it's so epic. Yeah, you know, I wrote it with Johnny Depp in mind, and I was thinking of directors like Ridley Scott. So right now we've we finished the treatment. It's a 16-page treatment. I haven't had a chance to... Uh, Again, the big thing about that is obviously getting the financing. You know, when you get a guy like Johnny Depp involved, you're looking probably between fifty and seventy-five million to make this movie. But it's a movie everybody around the world would want to see, in my mind. Yeah, just a reminder: we're speaking with Steve Thompson, music producer and, and now scriptwriter. Uh, Steve Thompson. Steve, let's make a quick comparison here for people who may know nothing about the recording process. Would you compare a producer, a music producer, to a director in a movie, or what? What are the similarities? What are the differences? Yeah, there are. You take a guy like Steven Spielberg. You know, there's certain uh, directors that can have total creative control, and certain ones don't. Depends on your name. Me as a uh, as a music producer, I get involved in all aspects of the songs that the artists have, whether it be co-writing them arranging them, recording them, mixing them. So you get involved in every step of the way, you know, tempos, this and that. You know, and I I have to probably say Clive Davis was my biggest influence in music. He taught me the value of a great hit song, and I love him to death for that. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. What does a producer have to do? In other words, what must a producer do in order to be doing his or her job? Well, there, you know, it's interesting. There, there's a lot of different types of producers. Some are just good at sound and let the artist go their own way. You know, to me, I'm like hands-on on every aspect of the song and the recording of the song. You know, I'll get a demo from an artist, I'll listen to it, I'll, you know, check out the lyrics, melody, and everything like that, and sometimes you go in the studio, you wind up rewriting parts to make things feel better, uh, you direct the singer, you know, with the approach vocally, and lyrics, it's just really, you know, I'm one of those guys that gets very involved, and I'm a hands-on type of guy, I learned engineering from Michael Barbiero, my ex-partner, who's like amazing. It was always Thompson and, uh, Thompson and Barbiero for years. Yeah, yeah. Michael was probably the best teacher in the world. Love him. What is he doing now? I believe he lives in New Jersey. I think he's got his own little studio in his house, and I'm sure he's still mixing and everything like that. You know, we haven't spoken in a while. 
I saw you guys back when Signs became a a, a number one hit, uh, and that's yeah. that's our friend's <laughs> Tesla there. I, did that surprise you? Yes and no. First of all, you know, it's really tough to have a cover go number one, and, you know, they decided to do a cover record, and I thought it was great. And it was you a, know, um... It was a song a lot of people didn't know was a cover. Yeah, well, that that happens a lot, you know. That's why you know, it, it tends, you know, to bring artists say, well, let's do this. I mean, when I'm... I'm going to be recording the new Tesla record, and we, I actually pick one song I really want to record with them, and normally with a band like Tesla, I don't want to do a cover, but... I remember watching the last uh, episode of Entourage, and I heard the California song by Led Zeppelin, and it just hit me. I said, this would be perfect for Tesla. Mm. So I, I, I mentioned it to the band, and Jimmy Page is a good friend of ours. He says, let's do the song. We'll bring Jimmy in, even though Frankie Hannon can play every guitar part like amazingly. But let's bring Jimmy in. But the twist of the song is, you know, the song is very acoustic, very um, mellow. But I want to build it up heavy in the middle of the song just to give it a little different edge. <laughs> <laughs> That's that. Yeah, it's a quite... I like screwing with things. I, I remember um, working with a band, Life of Agony, and we did Don't You Forget About Me by Simple Minds, and we just made it. Oh, my God, it was yeah. so intense. Oh, that was a great record. <laughs> they, were, they were on Roadrunner, I think. Right, Life of Agony? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Life of Agony, yeah. They were good. They're actually from Brooklyn. Yeah, yeah. I mean, quite a diversity of, of people here. What about Metallica? <laughs> What was it like working with those guys? Well, that was interesting. I mean, we've done a lot of work with uh, Cliff Bernstein and Peter Mensch. You know, they managed, uh, at the time, they managed Metallica, Tesla, Def Leppard. And we got a call to do Metallica, and I loved them ever since their first record. You know, they weren't really, they were underground known at that point. I said, sure, I'd love to work with them. So we were doing Injustice for All, and we did it up in Bears Little Studios, upstate New York. And at the time, Metallica was doing the Monsters the Rock show. So Lars and James Hetfield would fly into helicopter just to meet with us and go through the mixes and everything. And I remember the, fir uh, the first one we worked on together, Lars was very specific how he wanted his drums to sound. So I told Mike Barbier, I said, okay, Mike, why don't you work with Lars and get the drum sound he's looking for? And so Mike did that. They spent a couple hours on it. And I said, okay, this is what Lars wants. And I listened to it, and I was, like, scratching my head when I heard that. So I said, okay, why don't you guys leave, and let me set up the rest of the track and everything like that. So I wound up changing the drum sounds to the way I felt they should be sounding. Brought everything up, worked on the guitars, the bass, and everything like that. The bass was great. It, 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 it was a great unison part of the guitar parts and everything like that. Hetfield was in, loved everything, so I felt real good about where, where it was. So Lars walked back into the room and uh, probably listened to it for about 20 or 30 seconds, and he tells me, nah, stop, shut that off. I said, what's up, Lars? He goes, what happened to my drum sound? And I said, well, I thought you were kidding. <laughs> <laughs> He wasn't. So he says, okay, get back to the other drum sound. I said, Lars, but it's, this sounds so much better. He says, get back. So at the end of the day, it's their record. you got to go with it, you know? Yeah. So we get back to the, his drum sound. He says, all right, you see the bass? I says, yeah. I said, I want you to drop it down in the mix where you barely audibly can hear it. So I thought it was a joke. So yeah. I did that. And you could probably hear it. He said, okay, now drop it down another 4 dB where you couldn't hear it. And then I looked at Hetfield. Hetfield put his arms up near like he says, hey, this is the way it's got to be. And I said to myself, what is up with that? But, you know, I found that later on, you know, Cliff Burden just passed away. Yeah. And I guess they were kind of hazing Jason. Yeah. And I guess they didn't want to make him prominent at that point. But I was aggravated. I said, this sounds like crap to me. So I remember calling up Cliff Bernstein. I said, Cliff, you know, really love this band. I mean, they are the godfathers who started this type of vibe. Uh, you know, we can go back to Black Sabbath, whatever. But I don't agree with this direction, and I feel maybe you need to get somebody else to do this record. Because at the end of the day, it's going to say, mixed by Steve Thompson and Mike Barbiero, and that's going to be a reflection of what we do, and I know it sounded wrong. <laughs> what was his reaction? So I'll make a long story short. My manager called me up and says, you know, hang out with it, and we wound up doing that. I said, my only regret on that album is not spending the time on my own to at least mix it the way I hear it, just to have a copy of it. <laughs> Jeez. Ultimate. But Lars was very dominating. I remember yeah. um, we uh, they got elected to the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame a couple of years ago, and they invited us and they flew us out there. 
And I remember Lars coming up to me. He goes, hey, Steve, we did a bass in that record, didn't we? Like he didn't remember what actually happened. So yeah. I had to explain it to him. <laughs> well, and what was his reaction to it when you explained it to him? Did he acknowledge? Oh, okay. I said, <clears throat> excuse me. I said, Lars, if you want, uh, let's remix the album right. But, you know, who knows what the shape of those tapes would be in today because there was about 50 million edits in the multi-track. Yeah, and I'm sure when a tape sits that long and you have that much splicing tape on there, it would probably all fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned a manager. Was that Her Hernando Courtright? Did he manage you? I'm sorry, who? You mentioned uh, a manager. Were you talking about Were you talking about Bernstein? Oh, no, my manager at the time was An Andy Kipnis and Mark Bevan from AAM, Advanced Alternative Media, which is in New York. Right, right, okay. Uh, how was Bernstein it to work with? They were great, you know. They they were like, you know, they were into the music the vibe, and they still are today. You know, they, they they're, they're great people, very uh, knowledgeable. I I believe they manage bands like Muse now. I mean, they always. That's like you know, my ex matches and the Kipnis and Mark Bevan, is they were always able to do the new school thing, and that's what I really love about them because you know, and that's the way I'm all about. You know, as, as I'm all new schools. Like people today keep complaining about the music sucks today, this and that, and I disagree. You know, uh, obviously a lot of music today is very computer driven. You know the Average person can actually turn on a computer and actually compose some music without knowing a note. So a lot of purists will say that's blasphemy. But hey, whatever it takes, there is good music out there. You just have to look. Well, you know, is it Led Zeppelin? Is it this and that? No, but things change. From the business standpoint, what is it about Bernstein and Mensch that made them so successful? I mean, you dealt with them with Tesla and Metallica. Obviously, they had a lot of difficult personalities to deal with. Well, at least, you know, when you talk about Lars, that's for sure. But what was it about them that made them so good at what they did? Well, first of all, they had the complete package, had a great touring um, setup. And that's so important when you're dealing with artists is having that machine that, you know, let's face it, today artists make the bulk of their money touring. And they had that down, just like Irving Azoff with Live Nation, even though I don't think he's there anymore. No is having that machine, and they had the right people to be able to do that, and they were the right people to be able to handle all the nuances of managing artists and, and, and dealing with record companies, publishers, this and that, and the road. We're they were speak perfect. They, they, they knew what it took. We're speaking with Steve Thompson, producer extraordinaire, music producer extraordinaire. Uh, you've had a list of hits, and I... I, I like everyone, you started with analog. When did you make the switch from analog to, say, Pro Tools or whatever you are working with at this point? Um, I believe it was actually even before Corn, probably the Butthole Surfers. It was kind of interesting. And um, give you a quick story. I remember in the late 80s, my manager, I was getting calls to work with bands like Poison and Warren. You know, not to disrespect them, but I just did not like that type of music. I said, if this is the type of music uh, I have to be doing, I'd rather not do anything. And then I got a call from a friend of mine, Steve Verbosky, who signed Soundgarden. Mm. And that Steve goes, would you mind working with them? I said, you kidding me? That was a breath of fresh air to me. So we're in the 90s now, and uh, obviously with my track record, all the records I worked in the 80s, you know, everybody looks to the new school of things. All right, grunge is big, and, you know, Thompson had all the success. What would he know about alternative music? I said, I'll show you what I know about it. So I picked a band out of Gary Gersh signed, Butthole Surfers. And I said, I'll show you what I know about Alternative. I produced that album, co-wrote the, the song Pepper, and it became the number one alternative record of the year. So we started working a lot with computers then. The big time was probably Corn Follow Leader record in 1998, when Pro Tools was just getting around, where I'd actually um, hired a Pro Tools engineer. I basically put him in a closet and tell him what I needed to do. And when he had, when he uh, got what I needed, then call me. <laughs> but what I love about Pro Tools today and then yesterday is that I got rid of tapis, which I've always hated. Yeah. And every, all the purists will say, well, analog sounds fatter and richer. But if, if, if you come from the old school of technology and marry with today's new school, you can find ways to get that warmth and fatness on Pro Tools, if you know what you're doing. So I love it's a great, uh, you know, I use Pro Tools as a tool and not a performer. A lot of people today 
will basically put everything what they call a grid, make everything perfect. But I don't do that unless, of course, I'm working with dance music or electronic or dubstep. Then you could do that. But when you're working with an artist, it's very important to pay attention to the performance, the arrangement, and the feel of a song. And looking at a Pro Tools screen, you're not going to develop feel by, you know, connecting all the dots and making everything perfect. Producer Steve so Thompson. So that's basically, and I love Pro Tools. I think it's great. It, it, it just really makes my job a lot easier in the studio. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. Producer Steve Thompson is our special guest. Let me jump back on something you mentioned. You were talking about the Metallica recording, that, and that was for Injustice for All. You did that session at Bearsville. That's Todd Rundgren's studio, am I right? Well, that's a misconception. No, Todd had a studio up there, but no, this one, um, actually, the studio was started by Albert Grossman. The former okay, manager of... Bill and yeah. Dennis Joplin. Okay, and then after Albert died, his wife Sally took over the studio, and they owned the Bearsville Theater, Bearsville Studio. I don't think Todd had much to do with Bearsville Studio. He had a record label. In fact, it was kind Bearsville. of interesting. You know, uh, before Albert died, we were supposed to meet up with him. And on his flight back, when he had the heart attack, we were supposed to meet up with him, meet him, and it was it was a shock when he passed away. But it was a great studio environment. You know, it's up on a hill in Woodstock. Uh, you know, great big rooms, had everything we needed, uh, had living quarters for the artists that we work with. So it was a great environment, you know, because I think it's really important when you're working with an artist or band is to have no distractions. So obviously, I've done a lot of work in Manhattan, Electric Lady, you name it, every studio there. And when you have a, you know, a band in New York City, and they're not from New York. They're going to want to have fun. And so it was better for us to take the bands up there. Who did you first start noticing as a producer? The the records of Blank really started making an impression on what a producer is. And, and how early was that? Well, really, I have to say George Martin, Quincy Jones... What I really appreciated about George, and again, I understand, you know, what the Beatles did after working with John and sitting down with Paul McCartney. I understand what the roles with the Beatles were, and I understand the role of what George Martin did. And when you I had four tracks to work with, and the intense productions that they wound up doing in those four tracks, and the rebouncing, and this and that, I thought was genius. Because it's interesting, today you have a, a unlimited amount of tracks you can use, and I always tell artists... The less tracks you record, the bigger it's going to sound. You know, because everybody just lay, does layers and layers upon instrumentation. After a while, it just becomes a log jam. So I'd say George Martin, Quincy Jones. I remember watching a Quincy documentary where he'll take a 60 piece orchestra, like working with Sinatra. And Sinatra's the type of guy you bet again in one take because he's not going to give you two takes. Right. So you're, and he likes to play with the orchestra. It's not a question of recording the orchestra, and he'll sing over it. He wants the orchestra there while he's doing it. So the, the rehearsal mode involved in doing that was great. I mean, what, what really floored me is Quincy goes, okay, guys, let's take it from bar 71. One, two, three, boom. It's like putting a needle on a record. That's how tight 60 people, musicians were when I couldn't even get four rock musicians to play in the same key. <laughs> it's amazing. Just amazing. Uh, going back, way back, your earliest memory of, uh, you were a guitarist, am I right? Yeah, I was probably one of the world's worst guitar players. I, I'll be the first to admit it. I actually studied under Jack Starr at a band called Burning Star. Oh, my God. And I Jack, just... amazing guitar player. And I remember uh, I traded, I had a Ludwig drum set. I traded him, and he gave me a 54 Les Paul gold top. Oh. So how cool was that? So wow. I would play with Jack every day. Had it, had it to the point where I carried my guitar wherever I went, and I had what they called a pig nose amplifier. We could actually put it on your belt buckle yep. and, and play away without with, with batteries, which great was really little cool amp, back in actually. the day. Yeah, it was a great little amp. Yeah, it was, it was great. You know, because at that time, I mean, you would have portable. It was awesome. You still have that Les Paul? Oh no, God! I wish I. I think I sold it in '74. In fact, one of the guys in the Good Rats bought it, and I'm sure he still got it. Oh. That was a, a big mistake. I mean, there's certain instruments that I had throughout the years I wish I would have kept. I remember 
I was DJing in this club in um, Long Island, and Tito Puente would play there every Tuesday, and I wound up buying his LP Timbales. Mm. Probably made in the 50s, all, all chromed out and everything, and got rid of them too. Terrible. Well, how did you get to that? But I still have a, I still have a huge selection of guitars, amps, keyboards. Uh, when I worked with Ozzy, um, uh, I got a Les Paul Custom and an SG Custom uh, through them, and it was you know awesome. Probably still one of the best guitars I ever used to record. That's amazing. I, what route do you take going from, let's say, a student of the guy in Virgin Steel, you know, that's uh, Jack Starr, and uh, to get to the point where you're DJing, and really, I guess that's what acted as the launch pad towards your, your production career. Where where do you go from being a guitar student to where you start making some progress in the business? What What's that Well, route? it's kind of interesting. I mean, you know, when obviously when I was younger, did I ever think I was going to be in the music business? Heck no, I was going to be an architect. That's what I went to school for. And so, you know, being a lover of music, I mean, you can go back to high school, you know, we had the senior lounge. I was the one bringing the records in because I always loved music and had the biggest record collection. When I got out of high school, I started working in record stores like Sam Goody's and worked on these record chains and always got in there. And probably the artist that floored me the most in the early 70s was David Bowie. I remember working at Sam Goody's and... Um, well, the guy says, hey, check this guy out, okay? It'll probably take you 50 times to get it, but once you get it, you'll be hooked. And I said, and he was a Ziggy Stardust album, so yeah, right. So little did I know, I was so hooked. I went to go see David Bowie at uh, Radio City Musical, I believe it was in 1974, the Ziggy Stardust show. And again, you have to understand, I've been to every major concert possible, from Zeppelin to Black Sabbath to everyone. I've seen them all. And Bowie floored me. What I really loved about Bowie was able to change every record. No matter how successful it was, he changed it up the next time around and was more successful. Love that about an artist. Now, so you have to understand, I was working in record stores. Uh, the band kind of, you know, didn't happen. I, I went, got a gig and started DJing because I had a huge record collection. So uh, after I did that, you know, when you're a DJ, you start playing around with arrangements of songs. You know, if you have four turntables, you can extend the life of a song by, you know, using them back to back. So in probably around 1976, I had a club owner who loved my shows, would listen to them at the end of the night, and he wound up working for TK Records and brought me in and said, hey, this guy's great. The Henry Stone was the owner of TK. This guy's great. Why don't you give him a shot? to work on some artists. And obviously, I, I didn't know what I was doing. <laughs> but I knew how to make something happen. So I started doing remixes for dance music in the mid to late 70s. Mm. And once I got my chops going, then I started knowing what I was doing. So you wind up rearranging, re-recording, this and that. And then I found my niche. I said, well, hey, I'm able to communicate with musicians. I know what I'm doing arrangement-wise. So that's basically how it started. I mean, I kept DJing until I couldn't do anymore because of all the studio time. How old were you when you worked with TK, uh, TK Records? Oh, I was young. Very young. Yeah, yeah. Teenager, early... 20s? Yeah, yeah. Late teens, early 20s. Now, at this point, let me ask you, what was the turning point in your career? Or if you prefer, what was the turning point in your life? Turning point in my career uh, would probably everybody's going to say Guns N' Roses because that was probably the biggest record. But you know, I did work on a lot of big records before that. But I, I guess if you look at it, it's probably working on that record. Hmm. And my life is meeting my wife Joanne. That I was a turning point in my life. I mean, it was a very successful model actress from Seattle. You know. Uh, Goes to New York on no money to make it on her own. Her dad owned family sitting in this health spa. They had everything there and decided to make it on her own. And we met up and we were so opposite. And we just became best friends. And she was there from thick and thin. And so, you know, I always feel you need a partner in life to keep yourself grounded and, you know, stay hungry. You're still, you're still together after all this time. That's fantastic. That's a success story yeah. in, the, in the business. Uh, not a lot of that going on. 
I, you know, I'd be crazy not well, to. Yeah, yeah, you know, I just you have to know what your priorities are. I mean, I love making music. I love being creative, this and that. But at the end of the day, you know, uh, I've never, I've always stayed humble. Let's put it that way. You know, I never look back, and I just feel honored to be able to do what I do. I mean, I have so much respect for the police and firemen out there, what they do in life. It's just like, whoa, you put your life on the line. And look what I do. I'm making music. <laughs> And you're doing it very well. Steve Thompson, producer, record producer, Steve Thompson is our guest. Steve, you have kids? No. You know, we decided not to have kids for the only reason I've always been on the road a lot. And I'm an old school Italian that, you know, I feel that if you're going to bring kids up, mom and dad have to be there for them. Yeah. And I felt it would be a bad environment to bring my kids in the studio all the time. So we, you know, we made a conscious effort. And, you know, obviously, you know, we would love to have kids, but... You know, for the type of life we have, it just wouldn't work. And I, I just think it's wrong to bring somebody in this world if you can't, they can't be guided properly. I'd be crazy not to ask you about the work you did with John Lennon. I mean, that has to be that has to be one of the highlights of your life. Uh, I, well, oh, I want, that was. Yeah. yeah, I worked on the Milk and Honey album, which is the album right after Double Fantasy, and it's probably uh, a year after John passed away. It was interesting. That I met, uh, there was a club called Club 82 in New York, which was a glam club, transvestite club. Yeah. In the early 70s, I met Bowie, Lennon, and Jagger that night in the club. And uh, yeah. it's amazing. I actually worked with all three of them. And I did work with the Stones as well. But uh, it was interesting. Uh, Yoko was auditioning people to put this record together, which was, consisted of a lot of demos of what John was working on. Because I think when they were doing... Um, Double Fantasy, they they had a double record in mind, so they had all these songs prepped up. So I think Yoko auditioned probably about 50 million people. I, I you know went to the Dakota, sat down, asked me a lot of questions, reading my tarot cards, I guess, to see the, the vibe was right. No kidding. And I remember, so I did this uh, interview with her, and I remember getting a phone call about 5 in the morning, and it was funny because I was just getting back from the club from working all night, from her assistant, Sam Avatroy, says, uh, Yoko would like to see you now. And understand, I lived in Long Island, so that means I had to drive to New York right then and there. So I got there. I got all the way there. Sam tells me, well, you got the gig. <laughs> I had to drive all the way. He couldn't tell me that on the phone, but I was so <laughs> pumped up because, again, growing up and, and, and listening to what John's done in his life is a complete honor. And I was so thankful that Yoko trusted me. So I remember putting up the tracks, and there were a lot of demos and everything like that, and Yoko's vision was to bring Paul Schaefer in, which is Paul's a good friend of mine, and build up these tracks musically. And I kind of talked her out of that. I said, you know what, there's a certain charm here. I think it would be better represented if we didn't do that and put, you know, make them sound great, you know, fix them whatever needs to be fixed, and just put them out that way. So she goes, nah, I really want to bring it in. And we kept going back and forth, and she finally agreed to do that, which, thank God, you know, because I think she made the right decision. And I think the first thing was, nobody told me to be days like these. But they had a certain charm. I mean, there was some songs that were written on cassette. You know, John would sit in the studio, put the cassette on, sit by, be on the piano, and play it. And that's what we had to deal with on certain songs. How did you find Madonna? But, uh, I remember telling Paul that story years later. And I remember Paul wanting to work with me, and I, this was probably the mid-'80s, and I mean, you know, I'd give my right leg to work with him, but I really didn't believe in the music he was working on, so I kind of passed on it. That was hard to do. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no doubt about it. Look, he's still going strong. He does such great work. I, how did you find Madonna? Well, yeah, Paul, I mean, I, I think it was really good that he, he put this band together and he got his youth back. I think it's really important because there's a time, he, you know, he's the campy one of the two. But, at, you know, now I just think that he's got the great lineup together and I think they're doing really good. Turning Point with Frank McKay returns right after this. Welcome back to Turning Point with Frank McKay. Uh, tell me about working with Madonna. What kind of interaction did you have with her? Well, she wasn't in the studio. I remember, um, who was it? Uh, one of the guys from Warner Brothers. Oh, 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 let me think. Uh, who was heading up Warner Brothers at the time? Um, 
A and R guy goes, okay, we have this true blue record out. We have the song "Open Your Heart." I mean, we're getting ready to put out another album, but we're just going to give it one last effort. Would you mind working on it? I jumped at the chance, and um, I met Madonna years before when she was dating Jelly Bean in in, in uh, one of the clubs in the city. So I got the song "Open Your Heart." And I listened to the song. I brought some musicians in to recreate because I wanted to make it a long, epic song. I wound up making it 10 minutes and 25 seconds long. Jeez. And the reason why I did that, I said, every DJ needs a bathroom record, right? <laughs> so if I can make it long and interesting enough, this will give DJs the time to do what they have to do. So at the time, you know, we didn't, I wish that we had the technology of today then. It would make my life a lot easier. But I would do every trick in the book to make the song interesting for over 10 minutes long. And, you know, Madonna got the track, and she loved it and everything like that. Then we started working on other songs, Who's That Girl, and, you know, we did a couple other ones. It was great. You know, Madonna's not a great singer. She's a stylist. Yeah. It's, you know, it's like Lady Gaga. I mean, I call Lady Gaga the new Madonna. Yeah, well, no, no question you know? about it. She, well, she's trying uh, desperately to be the new Madonna. She, I don't think she makes any apologies for it either. I mean, she's having a great career, and and Madonna's had such an incredible career. And Madonna, uh, you know, that, that's a good comparison. No question about that. Well, yeah, I mean, Madonna's always and it's like Bowie. She's always surrounded herself with the right people to do what she needed to do. A very smart businesswoman as well. Oh, bro and brilliant beyond. Uh, we are with Steve Thompson. Record producer Steve Thompson. Steve, if you had to generalize some type of advice to give to young producers, or even for that matter, just people trying to make it in the music business, what can you give as a generalization at this point? Don't quit your day job. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot. You know, it's basically knowing what people react to, knowing great songs. And everybody says, well, how do I get into it? A lot of times you have to find your own talent work on them yourselves, and present it. You know, uh, again, it's going to be very hard for somebody who doesn't have any background to get in the music business. It's so like most businesses, you have to basically work on your own. So if you are a musician, look what's out there and look what, see what you can contribute to what's out there. Again, you know, in my life, I found it very important to always see the new stuff. Never look back. Always look ahead, and that's the way I've always done that. Because everybody says, "Well, you've done this and that." I said, "That's meaningless today. It's what I'm doing today." And so you got to find your way to make a mark. Thank God there's the internet today where you can actually get out there and at least get into the public by showing your stuff. You know, I don't. There's pros and cons to putting your stuff on YouTube. You know, obviously it worked for that. What's his name? Gangman guy. <laughs> <laughs> You know, stuff like that, self-promotion, you know, the problem is that, you know, if we get into the monetary aspect, you know, where, you know, digital has actually killed it, I, I, you know, we can also say the Internet has killed a lot of businesses around the world, as we know, whether it be music, entertainment, newspapers, post office, this and that. You have to deal with it. You know, you have to find ways to make the Internet work to your advantage. Build up your following. Build up a, a noise. I mean, that's what people are going to look at. We're with Steve Thompson, producer, record producer. Uh, Steve, how does somebody get to you? Is there a website? Is there some type of uh, mechanism? Right now, you? my website is under construction. I'm sorry to say about that. You know, we had Flash on it, which I hate Flash, but it looks great, so I'm redesigning it. But anybody wants to get a hold of me, they can get a hold of me through my email. That's my best way. It's thompsonsmusic53 at gmail.com. T H O M. P S O N S music fifty three at gmail dot com. I always look for you know new stuff and you know everybody says well is he unapproachable? Of course I'm not. No, hey, it's my job to look what's out there. But you know the one thing, the bad thing about the internet is being on Facebook, which I have over five thousand friends. I'm still trying to figure that out, and they won't let you add any. Yeah. Is that uh, you know I only work with bands that have budgets. You know everybody wants me to do everything for free. I mean we can't make a living that way. <laughs> no, it's certainly not nowadays with uh, with all the piracy going on and everything else. Uh, what do you do from here? Uh, you you're working on you, you have your script done. You're shopping your script. What else are you doing? I have three artists in my like I said I'm getting ready to do a new Tesla record. I have this band out from Australia that we're going to talk about working with. I'm also working with this band, the Starry Nights, out of Florida. 
great band. If you look at The Cure meets Depeche Mode in the year 2013 with Electronica, that's what they're in. I've worked on some dubstep stuff, which is kind of cool. Work with an artist, Snow. No, I'm, I'm keeping uh, real busy. There's other, I'm talking about John Papa doing a solo record with him from Blues Travel, which would be kind of fun. Yeah, that, that sounds interesting. Yeah, you know, John goes, so what's the direction? And I said, John, you know, I can't see you doing electronic and dubstep, so let's just turn <laughs> that one off right now. John, can I see you doing the country market, which to me country is just basically modern pop music. I think rock musicians have, have drawn went to the country line because that's so they could still be rock musicians. There's a way, I mean, I would love to do a duet with him and Taylor Swift. I think that would be great because John has that Cat Stevensy type voice. With John, I said, John, I'd recommend let's do a Daydream record, okay? Uh, you know, obviously, you know, he's known for running around and hook and everything like that. Let's do a record you can put on from top to bottom like Marvin Gaye once had with What's Going On, mm. which is kind of interesting because Justin Timberlake's new single has a very reminiscent uh, Marvin Gaye instrumental background to his new song, which, <laughs> which is kind of interesting because I, I think music now, obviously electronic has been real big, and the kids love it, and I get it. Because I was down at the Ultra Music Festival, seeing 160,000 people going off on, you know, the the, the rock band city are, are, are people like Skrillex and all these other DJs where they command performances. They play in front of 60,000 people. Mm. Love the energy and I love the light shows. You know, but, you know, I think pop radio has gone to a point where they're getting away from what they call floor on the floor music. And I think, you know, I remember Beyonce saying that I want to get back to R&B. And I think that's a good thing, you know. Uh, you know, you can see the success of like an artist like Adele, making good, timeless, classic music. I mean, that holds no age barrier to me. And and I love electronic. I used to love trance and techno when it came out in the early '90s. Love that vibe. So there's a, a big diversity of music out there, and obviously that a lot of styles have grown together, which is really good. I think it's very helpful. But I think you're going to see. Uh, a move to more classic R&B sound. Again, that's my prediction. Well, I'll tell you, coming from you, it's, it's certainly worth paying attention to. Very few people have had the career this man has had. We want to thank you all for listening, and certainly we want to thank our special guest today, Steve Thompson, music producer Steve Thompson. And again, the name of the film that you're shopping is Souls. Everybody should keep keep an eye on that for next couple of years, right? It's a whole different process. Well, again, I would love to do it yesterday, but knowing how Hollywood reacts, <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's, there's a lot of stepping stones. Yeah. My next thing is to sit down with a, with a writer and write the script, and then I'd like to film an EPK, probably about 15, 20 minutes. To sh you know, I have special effects people in Europe that are amazing to put together the concept and everything like that. And, you know, unfortunate thing in creativity, I, I think that, happens with the government, too. There's so much red tape and so much paperwork involved. If they can get rid of that, it would be a lot easier. Yeah. Obviously, you know, even with Hollywood, they want to keep the budget slow, and I don't want to cheapen this. And again, I'm not going to be like James Cameron and spend five million, $500 million. That's not what I'm about. But at the same time, I'm not, you know, I want to make something that stands the test in time. That's very important to what I've done in my music career. And it's what I, you know, I've worked on a lot of movies. You know, I, I was blessed. At one point, I had a choice to work on Return of the Jedi or Flashdance. And I picked Return of the Jedi, even though I knew Flashdance would be musically more successful. But I'd rather be associated with Return of the Jedi. <laughs> yeah. yeah, no doubt about that. I, I mean, I would, I would take that bet <laughs> in a million years. Yeah, I mean, I still have it framed, you know, with my name under the title on, on the record cover. It's so cool. But That's I mean, amazing. I, I, you know, movie producer, I love Stanley Kubrick. I, I love all these, you know, actors. I love Charles Lawton. I mean, I can go back whatever. But, you know, I really feel that there's so much creativity out there, and I really feel, and this happens in all business aspects in every company, embrace these creative people. Give them security, and you're going to have a better business for it, you know? And, you know, record, you know like, a, for instance, record says, well, we don't have the money to be able to develop the RSO. We're going to devise a 360 deal. We'll take half of their publishing. We'll take half of their touring, half of their merchandising, and, and we might put the record out. 
<laughs> That's amazing. Where we've yeah, gone. I understand today's economics, but in order to make money, you have to spend money and you have to develop it. But it's like with any any business in the world. Well, I got to say, it's been a, a, like a master's class or a doctorate class in the music business. Speaking with you, Steve. Again, we thank Steve Thompson, producer extraordinaire. Career still going strong, but very few people uh, have ever had a career like this man. And thank you all for tuning in. Turning Point with Frank McKay is brought to you by Herman Katz, Cam Jenny, and Klein, Duffy and Duffy, and Gold Coast Bank. Turning Point with Frank McKay was produced by Out of the Box Studios in Bohemia, New York. Executive producers Frank McKay and Harry Oates. Director of Operations Corey Arnold. Audio and Studio Engineering Francis Kazmarek. And James DeZigo of Sage Studios. Webmaster Eric Soule. Radio Segment Producer James DeZigo. Hotel and Accommodations provided by Ohika Castle Hotel and Estates in Huntington, New York. Transportation Services provided by Mark of Elegance Limousine in Hop Hog, New York. Catering Services provided by Windows on the Lake in Ronkonkoma, New York.